my gentle and, of course, very modern apes, I am here to narc on the scientific community. I hate to say it, but you have been tricked. You've been duped. You have been bamboozled. And to put it rather bluntly, you've been smeckledorfed. I say this because I am about to break some very tough news to you. Species are fake. <laughs> yes, that's right. The holy concept of organism differentiation is actually just a clever ruse. <laughs> you might be thinking, that is ridiculous. Species are clearly real, as anyone, perhaps even a five-year-old, could tell you that a giraffe and an elephant are different species. And to that I would say, perhaps. But what is a species, really? Go ahead, I'll wait. Don't feel bad if you find that defining what a species is is a bit difficult. It may even feel a little bit frustrating because species seem to be so dang intuitive, right? A dog and a cat are so clearly just different things, right? But cataloging precisely what it is that demarcates the line between a dog and a cat, or any living organism from another for that matter, is actually a very difficult task indeed, and it's one that Darwin noted himself. In fact, this has been a problem since Linnaeus invented taxonomy, even before Darwin. So in order to sort of come up with a solution to the problem, biologists through the centuries have been proposing different species concepts, if you will, in order to attempt to unify the field of biology in one way or another as far as how it is that we all define a species. You will be shocked to learn that biologists don't all agree on which species concept is actually the best species concept. And I would propose, along with many others before me, that this is because species are simply a human concept that we are imposing on nature. They're not real. The problem with species is that we as humans are attempting to apply a static concept, that of species, to a dynamic process, the ever-evolving members of the tree of life. Because of this, we end up utterly incapable of finding a species definition that can be applied in a standard fashion to organisms over space and time and across different reproductive strategies. To show you why it is that I feel this way, allow me to take this video and explain to you several of the most commonly used species concepts in order to show you how each one fails dramatically when applied uniformly to the entire tree of life. Because if species are a real thing, right, and not just a concept drummed up by our primate imagination, a human idea, then it should be able to be empirically standardized across all living things, in the past and in the present, ones that reproduce asexually or ones that reproduce sexually. If species are real, we should be able to find the line, shouldn't we? So we're going to be looking at all these concepts together, and I'm going to be using Zakos 2016 Biological Species Concepts, which is the most comprehensive work that I have seen in sort of modern times. The most common species concept proposed is that of the biological species concept. This concept relies on reproductive isolation as the barrier for species. If they can interbreed and produce viable offspring, then they're the same species. The biological species concept was promoted quite successfully by Ernst Mayer, being a central tenant of the modern synthesis. It is considered intuitive, as reproduction is such a visible property of organisms, and hybridizability often appears to be in sync with physical similarity. Formally, Mayer defined the biological species concept in 1942 as such. Quote, species are groups of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations which are reproductively isolated from other such groups, unquote. 
The fact that the word potentially is included is problematic as it means organisms which would never conceivably interbreed in nature, but may in captivity, should be considered a single species. For instance, by nearly every other species concept, lions and tigers would be considered unique and separate species. They live in dramatically different parts of the world, with lions in the African continent today and tigers relegated to the Asian continent. Their social systems, too, are disparate. Lions are highly social and tigers solitary. They have obvious physical differences, from pelage to craniodental features. And yet, under the biological species concept, these animals would be one species, as they can technically interbreed and produce fertile offspring in captivity. Polar bears and grizzly bears pose a similar issue, as do American paddlefish and Russian sturgeon. Even hybrids like mules, which are usually sterile, can occasionally exhibit fertility. In fact, of the entire animal kingdom, 10% of organisms are said to be, quote, involved in hybridization and potential introgression with other species. Species in nature are often incompletely isolated for millions of years after their formation, unquote. Entire genera are characterized as being good at hybridizing. Deer from genus Cervus, dogs from genus Canis, and hares from genus Lepus commonly interbreed intragenetically, but can easily fail outside their genus. For instance, a dog and a jackal can interbreed, but neither is capable of interbreeding with a fox, which is a member of their family. A potential solution has been offered by Coyne and Orr in 2004. They concede the hard line of species and instead propose that, quote, distinct species are characterized by substantial, but not necessarily complete, reproductive isolation. Unquote. This would mean that geographic isolation that limits gene exchange would act to separate interfertile animals, like lions and tigers, into separate species. Equally so, copulations that only occasionally result in fertile offspring would be considered separate species as well. This appears to be a viable solution at face value, but it is ultimately somewhat arbitrary. What if animal ranges overlap during only part of the year, or hybrids have a 51% viability? Where do we draw the line? The problems with the biological species concept continue, however. It has absolutely no applicability to the innumerable asexual organisms of the planet or to the fossil record at all. Sometimes we can glean DNA from extinct animals, as is the case with the hominin Homo neanderthalensis. In this case, we know that Neanderthals could hybridize with Homo sapiens. However, their ranges only overlapped during part of their shared existence, and recent work suggests that only some of the hybrid offspring between these two hominins were fertile. Under the revised biological species concept, they are different species, but this DNA does not exist for older hominins like Homo erectus or Homo naledi. Were these hominins interfertile with temporally or geographically adjacent species? The biological species concept also seems incapable of coping with ring species. In ring species, speciation is basically in progress. Populations that are directly adjacent may be interfertile, such as salamander A and B in this picture. Similarly, salamanders B and C may be interfertile, but A and C cannot interbreed and produce viable offspring. Thus, according to the biological species concept, salamander A and B are the same species as are B and C, but not A and C, breaking the concept as a whole. As such, the biological species concept fails utterly, both at demarcating species in the past and in the present. The similar recognition species concept, which leans on an organism's ability to recognize potential mates, fails for similar reasons. Just like the biological species concept, it cannot be applied to organisms of the past, of which we have few behavioral insights, or to asexual organisms. But even recognition is dicey, because desperate creatures aren't picky. For instance, Hamadryas baboons will sometimes mate with olive baboons, the social systems of which could not be more different. Hybrid offspring are technically fertile, but often fail to interbreed themselves, as they cannot fit into either social system. The evolutionary species concept and the phylogenetic species concept each have the opposite problem of the biological and recognition species concepts. The former defines a species as an ancestor descendant lineage which has its own unique tendencies and a unique fate. 
This concept solves the interbreeding issues presented by the biological species concept and recognition species concept since species are defined by their histories, but it fails to draw an empirical line with organisms of the past, particularly where cladogenesis is involved. The phylogenetic species concept similarly defines a species as the smallest distinguishable cluster with an ancestor-descendant relationship. This concept again fares better than the biological species concept with regard to living organisms, but becomes less and less applicable the more complete the fossil record becomes, as clusters become more difficult to diagnose. One might think that genetics would clear this issue up. After all, surely we can standardize base pairs, but it's just a hair more complicated than that. Chromosomes don't work, as members of the family Hylobatidae will hybridize indiscriminately. More overt are these swamp wallabies where males and females always differ in chromosome number. Genome size fails as well, given lions and tigers differ in genome size overall. So while genomes can denote relative similarity between populations or diagnosed species, they do not contain some intrinsic factor that allows for species denotation. There are a great many more species concepts that exist, you can watch them scrolling by right now, but I won't get into their definitions. Zacco's 2016 notes what biologists and naturalists have noted for centuries, that there is a species problem. And this is indeed a problem. For humans, anyways. Nature doesn't really care. <laughs> so are species real? No. But are they pointless? Yes. I'm just kidding, no. We are humans, the mighty pattern seekers. We like to take things and categorize them so we can better understand them. And in this way, species are extremely useful because they allow us to attempt to standardize the natural world in a way that allows us to communicate concepts to each other across time and across different cultures. So we can give groups of organisms names in order to kind of convey which critter it is that we're talking about and in which geographic location, so to speak. But species are objectively not real in the sense that they aren't demarcated or denoted by any kind of standard unit that can then be applied uniformly across the tree of life. This is what we would expect from organisms if they are constantly under the impact of evolutionary change. Populations bleed into one another genetically and morphologically. Interbreeding is messy and non-intuitive. Life is dynamic and flexible. This is why lions can mate with tigers, but maned wolves are reproductively isolated from dogs. It's why finding the time and organism where humanity begins and apehood ends is impossible. And it's why even the realm of genetics fails to cleanly separate out organisms. Species are ultimately static concepts given to a dynamic process, and so they are in turn doomed to fail. But if you think I'm wrong, Go forth and solve the species problem. <laughs>